Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Wherever you are in the world, you are most welcome to this celebration that has been organized to share and present to all of you and to the world uh, the book Root Tubers and Banana Food Systems Innovations Value Creation for Inclusive Outcomes. It is a great pleasure to be with all of you today. Many familiar faces, many people with whom we've worked over uh, this many years of the RTV program. The book is a collective achievement of RTV uh, as a model for collaboration that has fostered dialogue, innovation across multiple actors, including CGIAR centers, but of course also national programs and international uh, partners. And so it's, it's very exciting to be here with all of you today. You can tell <laughs> the excitement um, from all of us in sharing this presentation. Mm. I think we have a significant group already uh, joined the team. So we will start with a brief introduction from our um, RTB coordinator leader, Graham Thiel. He has been the director for the CGIR research program on roots, tubers, and bananas for the two phases that the program um, lived through. And uh, very proud also to share all of these findings with all of you. Over to you, Graham. Thanks very much for that introduction, Bibi. And if we can begin to share my presentation, please. Yeah, it's fantastic to have everybody. RTB has been a group of scientists. We work with farmers, but it's also been a kind of a, a team and a family working around these crops in amazing ways. So, of course, we're immensely proud of the book. And having the book launched today is kind of, in a way, the culmination of the efforts of the RTB program. Um, so I'm presenting on behalf of the entire team, all the editors, all the authors, and all the people behind this fantastic publication, which we're so proud to have out there. Uh, next, please. So Roots, Chips and Bananas program. This really is an outstanding model of CGIR collaboration. Now, the book isn't only about what we did as the RTB program, but certainly without the RTB program, we wouldn't have been able to have all of the achievements which feature in many of the chapters. So just to remind you, the RTB program brought together four different CGIR centers together with CIRAD to make this uh, to kind of um, provide the overall coordination, but it was a much broader based collaborative platform. We had 350 partners in total involved in co-innovation processes. And in the final phase, we counted up 77 major innovations which RTB contributed to. Next. So to remind you, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, Roots, Chibas, Bananas um, have some unique potentials. That over 400 million smallholder farmers depend on them for their livelihoods. They have very high yield potential. Uh, and they sustain diverse food and integrated food systems with potential value added post harvest. They're mostly locally produced, uh, so they may a bit, be a bit of more alternatives in times of volatility in, in grain markets to provide some more stability in, in local farming systems. They're especially important for women, but we've seen, and this was the major challenge as RTB got underway, there are major bottlenecks which require innovation to access that very high yield potential and to diversify those uses, which requires innovation also in the post harvest system. So this is what we really set ourselves out to do. And we progressively kind of zo zoomed in, particularly on these particular areas where expanded use of roots, tubers, and bananas requires innovation across these, I think I have five different areas. So the first of these is scaling itself. How do you take things to scale? So if you can like, you can say this is innovation in how you do innovation. I mentioned also that you need to reduce perishability and add value post harvest. And that's particularly important as people move increasingly to, to cities. You need to manage the pests and, and diseases, which are often associated with these crops. And seed systems in vegetatively propagated crops present particular, particular issues. And, and we need to get the improved varieties out through those systems so that farmers can benefit from these much high yield. And there's great potential also in using these crops to improve nutrition. So these are five particular areas of innovation which feature strongly in the book. So the, the book has 17 different chapters around these food system innovations and value creation. And they're fairly much aligned to those areas I mentioned. So we have an, an overview, an institution change chapter, uh, and we have a whole chapter on, on scaling and scaling readiness. We have five chapters around processing, marketing and distribution, and we have a block of kind of central chapters around enhancing productivity. And this covers pests and diseases. We've got a very novel chapter on innovative digital technologies, 
RTV is famous for its work on CE systems. And we've got a, a very wonderful toolbox and different pieces of contributions around understanding and in, intervening in those seed systems. So there's real progress in this area and that features very strongly in the book. We've got an excellent chapter on gender responsive and user responsive. Can you go back, please? We jumped a bit there. Gender responsive breeding. And last but not least, we've got a very exciting chapter around improving livelihoods and scaling, really a very nice chapter around scaling and the scaling readiness of the biofortified RTB crops, which present a lot of potential, but also need particular innovation packages so that consumers can benefit from the potentially improved nutritional benefits of these crops. So 17 chapters, very diverse, at the heart of them is CGI and RTB, but also more besides. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so really the innovation focus is a theme that runs all the way through this book. So we've taken scaling and what we could call end-to-end innovation, end -end innovation lies at the very heart of the RTB pro program and the book itself. So that's one really central feature um, that's I think immensely important at this time of as the one CGR of thinking about how to do business differently. So at the heart of much of the work in the final phase, we had the scaling fund or the RTB scaling fund. And the idea was to foster the scaling of the most promising RTB innovations so that they could reach their scaling potential and indeed their full potential for users. And the idea was to manage end-to-end -end innovation across the RTB portfolio. Can you click please? Yeah, so with the uh, scaling team in RTB in, in one of our flagships, we developed a whole approach called uh, scaling readiness and we had an innovation readiness scale and we use this scale to assess different within different chapters to look at scaling. And it was also very much behind how you move to a high level of innovation readiness, very much behind those um, uh, innovations in the scaling fund. Next. So actually six of the chapters feature end-to-end -end innovation, which came out of the scaling fund work. That's the flash dry and cassava work, the OFSP puree, cassava pills for quality animal fields, bacterial wilt management, triple S uh, system for storage in sweet potato and the rooted apical cuttings to drive adoption of novel potato varieties. So again, end to end innovation, really important the scaling fund to help drive that. And we're really pleased that our, our teams came through to write up these very outstanding chapters around that, that progress. But also the book is more than just a scaling fund. There's other chapters about other dimensions of seed systems. And we're very pleased to have complementary perspectives from non CGI authors. In particular, we have very strong chapters from transferring processing technology from Brazil to Africa with a team from uh, Embrapa. And we have a very nice chapter around improving the safety of cassava products, which was led by Lindley Chiwana Carlton. Next, please. So um, the last time we counted, and Ugo Campus is always catching me up on this. The last time we counted in just two weeks, we had 20,000 downloads of the book. According to Ugo, who is an expert on this, this is a kind of a record. So we have here a blockbuster publication. If you didn't download your copy, please do so. It's all free and share that with your friends and colleagues. Um, so and there's the, the book again. So next slide, please. Thanks everybody for putting this all together. So I'll, I'll stop there <laughs> and uh, hand back to Vivi. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Um, and thank you, all of you. I see uh, more people keep joining in. You've uh, heard about the overall structure of the book, the key topics that uh, have been presented there. So if you have questions and um, have comments that you would like to share, please put them in the Q and, um, and A section. There's a Q and A um, box at the bottom of the Zoom, Board of Trustees for the International Potato Center to share with us um, some insights on the RTB program as a golden egg, thinking about the institutional dimension, the structural dimension. Please, Helen. Thank you very much, Vivian. Um, also, thank you to uh, Graham for the previous introduction of the RTB program. Uh, I'm Helen Hambley Odame. I am a professor at the University of Guelph, and I have the great honor of having uh, been the chair of the independent uh, uh, steering committee or in independent advisory committee of RTB for uh, a number of years, as well as um, a member of the advisory committee. And I now have the tremendous honor of being the chair of the International Potato Center, SIP. So on behalf of the SIP board, I'd like to welcome you all here today and, and thank many of you who've made uh, an amazing um, and important contributions to RTB success as documented in this book. 
But the area I really want to focus on today is really about RTB as a program. And I think I can identify four P's that made RTP uh, so uh, very interesting and successful as a, as a collaborative initiative within the CGIAR. First, it's its people and partnerships. It's the processes that it that it evolved, and it's its overall performance. So let me just say uh, a brief word about each of these. First of all, on people, RTB brought together um, teams of staff and scientists, some of who had never worked before uh, together, and they were coordinated by a remarkable uh, program management unit. And the leadership in the uh, program management team also knew at the outset that the teams had to be articulated right across the entire program. And in this book, especially in chapter two, which what I had the pleasure of um, co-authoring was um, really a, a good detail uh, explanation of how these uh, teams work together to produce high impact science. We can see that even in the evidence of multiple external reviews of RTB that the stakeholders really did see um, a steady growth in science excellence in the program. There were many well-crafted management decisions that, that were taken, such as bringing communication staff into an integrated function in the program early on, making sure that gender expertise in the team was strengthened right across the program as much as possible, and other ways of investing in people that resulted in the best possible RTB science. The second area is partnerships, not just among the five uh, centers, four of which were part of the CGIR, so that's SIP, Bioversity, IITA, SEAT, as well as CIRAT, but also the common partnerships um, within the centers that um, were, were built up, sourced out, cross-fertilizing ideas in areas like genetic innovation so that you moved ideas from banana cryopreservation into potato cryopreservation, learning from sweet potato research to inform cassava value chain research, and really moving the dial ahead significantly in areas like scaling innovation and seed systems. The processes of RTB are really quite remarkable. I would say that chapter two, and I'm gonna apologize, it's one of the longest chapters, documents this extremely well, but this is an important contribution because often in uh, agricultural uh, science, we don't really see the institutional and the um, uh, sort of processes behind uh, creating science excellence. So chapter two really details the design and the management dimensions and how these contributed to success in innovation and development. Then finally, performance. Front and center RTB always put performance up front, but not sacrificing participation. Performance was really uh, addressed in a very open way in different governance functions. It was discussed and debated. Um, there was certainly um, a recognition within RTB that it always knew where it had come from and where it was going with its performance. It wanted to make sure that its theories of actions really rolled up into change. And a lot of work went into documentation in the program. Uh, sometimes it was almost onerous at times to um, for the for the program and for PNU to to manage this immense amount of paperwork. But I think overall RTB really was able to respond to the demands of a changing system, remain adaptive, make sure that it responded to different um, interests of the stakeholders and the partners, and make sure that it was coherent, most importantly of all. And uh, let me conclude by saying that RTB really had a capacity to be critical and uh, realize that it could lay golden eggs. But as a program, it probably was the golden goose itself. If you know this old Greek fable, you'll know that there were owners of a golden goose that laid golden eggs and gave them a steady um, and regular sort of source of wealth and success. The golden eggs were the result of taking care of the golden goose. And so keeping that golden goose in good health was in, intrinsic to making sure that there was productivity and success for the family. But there's a twist in this fable, just like there is in all stories. Unfortunately, um, the owners of the goose decided that they might kill the goose to take out all the golden eggs at once. And this was not an ideal situation because as we always say, your goose got cooked. And no more goose, no more golden eggs. 
So let's learn from RTB that keeping the goose in really good health, making sure that uh, golden eggs and um, opportunities and successes continue to uh, flow to the global system is really um, something that can continue on as one CGIR moves into its next transition. In my own, my own sense, I think that this is going to be an exciting time. The RTB program and its work will live on well beyond this book. It's going to continue to generate uh, innovations at scale that would that among the, the new partnerships across 1CGIR. And frankly, it's exactly what we need today to address many of the serious problems facing our world. So thanks very much, uh, Vivian and, and the entire team for having me here today. And uh, I really do look forward to uh, hearing the responses on the book and thanks for the involvement. Thank you so much, Helen, for your kind words. Um, but especially thank you for framing so nicely the angles of structural dimension that the chapter addresses. And I invite um, our audience who is currently engaged in the 1CGIAR transition in the development of projects and initiatives uh, to have a look at chapter two and see if you can pick out a few of those recommendations for the structural dimension, the governance element, and how to um, foster future golden eggs in your initiatives. We hope that this information will be useful to all of you. Uh, thank you again, Helen. I would like to now invite Lawrence Kent, who is the Senior Program Officer at uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, a partner and collaborator working side by side with the RTV team in many areas. Um, Lawrence will present demand-led research. Lawrence. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, let me start just by congratulating uh, the whole team for the production of this, this book and, uh, of course, all of the research and innovation that was achieved and, and then documented in this book. It, it's, a, it's a big book, um, over 500 pages. Um, and I will confess I have not read all 500 pages, but I think I probably have read 200 of them, uh, maybe about uh, six of the chapters and I, uh, or seven of the, of the 17 chapters. And, and, um, and they're great. And um, the, whole, the, whole, the whole book is great. And uh, I'm really glad to see that we've got 20,000 downloads already and hopefully we'll get uh, another 100,000 downloads before, before the year is out because uh, the, the book is, is innovative in itself. Um, I look at it within the context of, of one CJR. Um, and within the CJR, traditionally there's been a lot of emphasis on, on genetic improvement and breeding, which is really at the core of what the CJR centers do. But often there's been accusations that yeah, once the breeding takes place, that translating the breeding outcomes to impact has been less than what's been desired. And there's been there are great opportunities to do more in terms of achieving impact with the outputs of breeding programs. And this, this, this challenge is one that's been taken up by the RTB Collaborative Research Program and saying it's not just about breeding, it's not just about responsive breeding, but it's also translating the breeding outputs and integrating them into seed systems that can then deliver the planting materials to farmers who then can plant and grow them successfully with good agronomy and then sell the outputs to, to, into markets. <clears throat> and the whole end-to-end -end approach that the CRP program has taken is one that's demonstrated that it's really interested in, in unlocking the bottlenecks to achieve impact. And for that, I, I do praise the whole program and I praise the book because the book really goes end-to-end -end talking about responsive breeding, but then really spending a lot of time on seed systems and then helping farmers improve their productivity, their nutrition, and also linking themselves to, to markets to, uh, to, to drive demand. So that's really good. And one of the other aspects that I think is really um, uh, noteworthy within the book is, is, the, is the focus on seed systems. I realized I didn't have my microphone down. I'm sorry about that. Um, because the seed systems really are the linkage between the breeding outputs and the farmers. And traditionally, <clears throat> RTBs have been a really challenging area for seed systems um, because uh, unlike um, sexually propagated crops, the, 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 the seeds are uh, clonally propagated and, and relatively easy for farmers to save. And there really hasn't been the development of sustainable markets for seeds for most of the RTB crops. But, but lessons have been learned first by Irish potato that it is possible to create economically sustainable seed systems with the right technologies and the right approaches. 
And then we've learned, the RTB group has learned that that same approach with Irish potato can be applied in other areas, in cassava, in sweet potato, in yam, in ways that can go beyond simply multiplying and distributing free planting material, which is essentially something that's not particularly sustainable to try to transition to economically sustainable approaches where entrepreneurs produce and sell seeds in a way that uh, generates profits and incentivizes them to make high quality seeds available on a reliable uh, basis. And, and that's great. And, and that also links to this whole uh, challenge of scaling. And I'm really glad to see the way this book and the RTB program itself uh, took on this challenge of scaling. And, and scaling is a central theme throughout this, uh, throughout this book. So it's not just about breeding outputs and then you know, getting them to farmers, but it's also about hey, we've got to do this at scale. We don't want to do this just at a pilot level or just in the context of funded projects, but rather see how can we create systems that can, that, that can go viral, that can, that can develop and, and, and achieve big impact at scale. And I think you know, taking an economically sustainable approach to seed systems is one element of that. But also, as the book says, you know, systematically assessing scaling readiness issues throughout the system and taking that vision for scaling into account when making decisions all along the, the value chain. And the, and, the, and the book does a really good job about that. But I do challenge the authors of the book and all of us that are involved in RTBs uh, to say, okay, it's not just about scaling readiness, but it's about enabling scaling and not just assessing the readiness of these, of these innovations for scaling, but actually integrating them into programs that will allow them to scale. And, and the scaling pathways really have to involve either the government and, and big time government investments in scaling or the private sector and ensuring that the innovations are profitable and therefore the private sector is incentivized to scale them. So yes, develop innovations all along the value chain. And uh, yes, um, <clears throat> make sure they reach farmers. And then yes, uh, uh, check out the scaling readiness, but then link them to programs that actually can scale them uh, so they can reach uh, millions of farmers. And, I, and ultimately, I think that's what we're all about. And I thank the authors of this book for the big contributions towards this big vision of ensuring that innovations in RTB seed systems and RTB food systems really benefit millions. That's what we're all after about. So thank you so much and congratulations to the authors of the book. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for your kind words. And um, I think you've picked up on key elements of this, how we connect the whole process. And uh, you've picked up on some of uh, the topics that are close to our heart, like um, demand-led and gender-responsive breeding, but also the integration with seed systems. And we invite uh, the, the, the people present here, present here today to read uh, not only the chapter you know, is in terms of what can I learn, but also critical thinking in terms of what could I add for my research agenda in the future. The chapters some, have some key elements. We have uh, managed to include some agenda for the future in the different chapters. So it's for you to take up and critically look at them and, um, and identify how you could inform future research with these findings. Um, with that said, I would like to invite now Marco Ferroni, board chair of the CGIAR, um, who will share with us some words on innovation as a driver. Marco. Thank you so much, uh, Vivian. Um, I'll get to innovation, but uh, you will also hear that um, many of uh, the comments that I will have to make will be, re will be uh, reminiscent of what we, what we have already heard. Um, I want to thank you, Vivian, and uh, the organizers for invite, inviting me to this important discussion. And I would like to start, colleagues, by paying tribute to the memory of SIP's late Director General, Dr. Barbara Wells. Why? Because Barbara was in, in, inspirational and instrumental in framing and guiding the game-changing work presented in the book that we are launching today. The book that we are launching, colleagues, is, to me, <clears throat> a tour de force on account of its comprehensiveness in the way it brings together the many different elements we now know are needed for two things, adoptable innovation to be able to arise and adoptable innovation to actually be taken up by users and at scale. I would like to congratulate the RTB leadership, the editors and the 117 authors of the 17 chapters of the book, as well as all others who contributed, who contributed clearly in uh, various ways. 
Now, why am I offering the compliment of game changing here? And game changing is no small thing. Well, for at least four reasons, some of which have actually been mentioned by Helen, you'll find uh, that, 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 that I'm meeting up with, like I said, with, with some of what we've already heard. First, game changing because RTB put root, tuber, and banana based food systems on the map as major resources for value creation, food security, nutrition, livelihoods, and indeed economic growth. These have long been neglected crops from the point of view of research and policy attention, and that's no longer the case because of the RTB CRP and now the book. Second, game changing because of RTB's methodically planned and executed approach to internal and external partnership and cooperation through associative governance coupled with incentives as actually described in chapter two, strategic communications and an understanding of the need to support impact pathways, not only for single innovations, but complementary ones that feed on each other. The internal partnership across participating CGIR centers held together by a mixture of trust and legal agreements as described strikes me as a mini version of one CGIR, like you have actually suggested, Vivian. The maxi version that we are implementing now could do worse than seeking lessons here. Third, game-changing because of the demand-led approach documented throughout as a condition of adoptability of profit innovations. Mm. Chapter 16 on gender-responsive breeding, which is a key dimension of demand-led, starts by making the point that modern breeding has successfully introduced new genetics into high potential areas. I concur, and we have the literature on high rates of return to investment in agricultural research to prove it. But RTB has been about low potential areas in many instances and had therefore to develop approaches and tools that we can learn from across CGIER for those kinds of settings. Coming up with technology and solutions for vegetatively propagated crops that low income users consider relevant, the key condition for adoptability, and among those low income users, of course, including uh, resource poor women farmers in marginal areas. This is a tougher call. And fourth, game changing because of the thinking on innovation, scaling and scaling readiness that permeates RTB's work and the book and is widely applicable beyond. RTB crops. Scaling readiness for different scaling contexts is a concept to think about, to socialize and use. It has applicability beyond RTB. There is colleagues an epidemic of pilot projects out there that never scale and are never properly evaluated. Scaling readiness as, exp as explained in chapter three and tested in the RTB scaling fund could help weed out non-performing approaches before they go too far and make others productive with developmental and implementational help. Innovation has clearly been the overall driver behind the book, behind the work reported on in this book. Research, as we know, is not the same as innovation as the book rec rec recognizes, but innovation may require research among other elements of the combination of contributions that somehow need to come together for successful, useful, for something useful to emerge that finds its way to the market where it can then improve people's lives. RTB has made seminal contributions that we would ignore at our peril as we focus on the post-CRP phase of research in one CGIAR. Congratulations to the team. Thank you for your attention. Dear Marco, thank you for your very kind words. And I think you have um, you have touched on critical issues. We are very happy and the excitement rises from the team as we learn from you that um, you know much of these findings will be considered and incorporated in the in the new processes of development of the one CGIAR, and we're happy to contribute to that. Um, following back again, picking up from Lawrence. Uh, and your points about scaling. One angle of scaling is, of course, reaching farmers with seed. And that's where I would like to invite Connie Almekinders, Associate Professor of Wageningen University, who will talk about seed systems for the future, analyzing that angle of scaling, but also you know, thinking about the multiple angles and the learning coming from RTD crops to enhance seed systems for the future. Thank you, Vivian. I'm not entirely sure where I'll meet 
with your, your expectations, but I will say a few words about seed systems and this book. And uh, yeah, we're now at the last uh, presentation in a row of four, and we are with seed systems. And that excites me and, and, and again shows how important seed systems are. And uh, also the two former speakers have actually pointed out how much seeds and seed systems are very crucial components in, in many innovations and the scaling thereof. Uh, also, many innovations in this book that we're launching in this very meeting have a seed component. It's not only the RTB toolbox, but um, for example, the gender tools to breed better varieties are only coming to fruits if the seeds of those varieties are ending up in, in, in the right fields. And not every sweet potato variety makes good puree, and some cassava varieties store better and process better than others. And, and, and another example is uh, the multiplication, um, the rapid multiplication techniques. One potato variety may do well in areoponics techniques, where the other does not. So um, yeah, this, then the seeds of all these varieties that allow these innovations to perform and, and, and to capitalize on also have to find their ways to farms fields. So given the importance and, uh, of a good functioning seed system to support a very broad range of innovations, I'm very proud to be an ambassador here today of a book to which I can proudly say I've contributed. Because one of the golden eggs, eh, the RTB toolbox, is this described in chapter 11. And that's the product of many years of work of, uh, of the RTB seed system group. And uh, I think we have something to show and share and that others should know about. Um, from this rich collaboration, uh, there emerged more than 10 tools that are original or original adaptations to seed system work for various types of users and with the prospect to develop more and to expand. So um, Graham, Michael, Vivian and Hugo, <laughs> thanks for flogging us to produce this book. And Jeff, for you, uh, again, thank you for your wonder wonderful and skillful edit editing. I don't think Jeff is present in the audience, but I want to have him thanked specially. And a sincere thanks to all the others who collaborated in the book's production of this book from start to end. So yes, it is important to let the world know about the RTB-based uh, innovations in this book, um, because these innovations need to be scaled, as we've heard before. Um, and there is a nice chapter on scaling readiness. We've already heard that as well. Um, developing an innovation just like the RTB toolbox is one thing, but, but in a way that, that's only where the work starts. How to get to the next users and how to make sure that the things uh, end up to be better in farmers' fields, that's the real challenge. And we see that challenge with the toolbox as well. Um, the next users in our case are uh, probably the NGOs and NARI staff, uh, most of all. They are the real uh, last mile deliverers, the most difficult part of the entire route. And um, it's therefore great that there will soon be an African center of innovation for vegetative seed systems, where we can directly engage with these next users um, to make the seed system toolbox work. Um, I also want to emphasize the particular complexity of delivering innovations and seed in, in particular. Um, seed systems and seeds are in this respect, not just the carriers of innovation or things that just have to be delivered in farmer fields. Uh, seed systems are complex and, and they're crucial. And they all, they have their own characteristics that need to be taken in account to be effective. And that's what the toolbox, I think, uh, properly has, has been able to, 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 to bring to the fore. Um, the seed systems now and in the future um, have to deliver. Uh, and they have to deliver and cater for many farmers of all kinds, um, including women, youth, better off and poor households. In short, all those people that we call farmers and, and who most often have a broad range of other things on their mind. And, and these things require their time, they require their cash, their energy and their attention. And that's something I, I, I think we have to, to keep in mind that um, not all those people are active innovation seekers. Um, they will certainly not be the ones that 
try to find this, this uh, RTB toolbox with inclusive innovations. Now we have to call their attention and we have to let them know that there are innovations around and new seats available. Um, I think far, farmers have far more appetite for new innovations than we may think. Um, but these innovations, while they're very varied and the interests varied, we should not expect the people to come and look for us. We may have to bring the innovations closer to them, closer to them, maybe, maybe even to their doorstep, because um, especially the, the least prosperous and, and the most marginal and vulnerable, we cannot expect them that they're actively seeking us. Um, the, just for, for the toolbox, I would say for the RTB toolbox uh, for seed system work, let us shout out that we have tools to build a better seed future that can improve the availability and access to that diversity of seed that is needed out there and that bring all kinds of other innovations to fruit and toolbox that can help the next users to hammer out delivery pathways and delivery models. Um, and also for all the other innovations um, in this Springer book, I'd, let to, I'd like to say um, we may leave the book on the shelf physically or virtually, but we have to make the innovations fly. And so please, all of you spread the news, be an ambassador of these wonderful RTB innovations, all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Connie. Um, I see some, of, uh, some, some people already typing in uh, the box discussing about in the chat box discussing about how uh, there has been such fruitful collaboration and that uh, the networks and the teams that have been formed around RTB crops in multiple areas, including seed systems, will continue to collaborate and work in the future. So I think that's one of the, the golden eggs and one of the key results that we hope to expand towards integration in other crops. Um, if you have questions or comments, please type them in the chat box. I see um, Claire Hershey. Um, is there any chance we can enable audio for some of those questions, uh, Viviana? No, we, we no. haven't. Okay, so, so I'll read them out. So we have Claire here. She says, congratulations on the excellent work. How did you come to the decision to present this work as a book rather than a special issue of a paper um, of a peer review journal? Um, Graham, can you help me help us with that? Well, we had a great collaboration with Springer. I think that was part of it. We knew we'd had some previous experience with and we felt that a book could be more integrated though. As editors, we would have oversight of the whole thing in a way that we probably wouldn't. When you do a special issue, you go out to different reviewers, you lose control of the process and you probably lose integration. So we had a very strong st st different stories about innovation, end-to-end -in -end innovation, scaling readiness and gender as well. So by us being the editors of a book and controlling the content, I think we had more control over the content than we would have gotten with journal. I mean, maybe a journal, you get your impact factors and stuff. So there were pros and cons to both. But we're actually very happy that it turned out as a as a book. Um, probably we had a little bit more space there, and sometimes the the length restrictions. So you can tell a somewhat richer story, I think, in the book chapter than the. Um, I don't know if all goes. Oh, Ogle can't speak, can he? Uh, yeah, I think those are the, the main points there. So um, clearly some advantages. Yeah, from a technical point of view, I guess there's debates about about which route you go down. But I think we're very happy with the with the book option that we selected. Thank you, Graham. We have some words in the chat box from Oscar Ortiz. Uh, he says, thank you very much for the panel members for their words. Uh, they go to the RTB team who worked extremely hard to make this CRP a truly collaborative mechanism that developed a number of innovations. One of the main lessons is that innovations, oops, sorry, things moving. Innovations uh, come from fruitful interactions and collaboration and of course, an enabling environment. Yes, Helen, you want to come forward? Yeah, thanks, Vian. Um, I think uh, really we, we've had uh, fantastic and encouraging words about ideas that we, could, we can take forward. Um, not just the, the center, as Connie mentioned, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa for vegetatively propagated crops, um, but other, uh, other opportunities at the, the regional level would be exciting to explore. You saw in Graham's first um, slide um, the idea that we were able to cultivate 350 uh, partnerships 
across 77 innovations. I mean, this is quite remarkable that in, in even in a 10 year period that this was accomplished, science takes time and, and good science takes um, you know, uh, tremendous efforts as many of us know. So we, we really can start to look at, you know, how can we start to digest some of these lessons learned regionally as well as globally making sure that the regional needs and potential for partnerships are realized. I love the example of the um, uh, role of, of um, collaboration between um, uh, the South to South countries, so Brazil to um, countries in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. What other opportunities are there to do South to South exchanges of, of knowledge and, and um, experimentation and technology uh, transfer? You know, where where is the adaptive learning opportunities um, for the future of RTB? So these would be all the things that I'm going to be taking away today. And um, certainly as chair of the SIP board, I'll, I'll be able to have continued conversations, but I would also like to invite anyone to, to reach out to me and, and to um, uh, the uh, interim director general of SIP, Oscar Ortiz, if, if they have further ideas that we can, we can take forward. I think that's why events like this are so great. It's not just to launch the book, but to launch more action. <laughs> Thanks, Vivian. Thank you, Helen. Um, we have a question in the chat box from Rodney Cook. It says, question to Graham. The book describes the many RTB golden eggs. Are any key ones missing in the one CGI art portfolio of initiatives? Wow, Ron is a good one to put me on the spot. <laughs> are any of them, are any missing? Uh, I'll say the point is, so we've got, I think it's 13, we finally got to 13 golden eggs. Um, I, I'm not sure if they're missing. Some of them are perhaps, uh, there in different ways. It would it would be a good exercise to go back and track where they are. Um, so in situ was one I think that was a bit vulnerable, but I understand that it's found a home, a bit of a home in nature. I think it's nature based solutions. Um, and then some things have found their way perhaps into the CGI portfolio as a whole. I know there's scaling readiness has kind of been picked up. Maybe what would be missing? I don't see how the scaling fund itself. You know the scaling fund, which is a golden egg, but it is a kind of a key element of an institutional innovation. The flexibility around the um, the investment options. When you scale, you don't know beforehand exactly who you need to bring on board, right? How you need to do it. So the scaling fund had flexibility within it, and it had dedicated funding. So I think that would be something that should really be explored. How do you create these flexible spaces for funding, so that these other great things can happen? Because it's not predetermined. Your part, your partnerships are kind of emergent. As scaling happens, you bring in different, and we actually substituted, we changed who our scaling partners were, and where they weren't pre-known. So sometimes you kind of get locked in from the beginning of a project to a specific set of partners where we see that the, the need for flexibility means you switch. So I think that for me would be one thing. I, I don't quite see how it's there. I know the one today is struggling with its funding, and funding for partnerships is often particularly problematic when funding's short. So how do you have that sort of flexible? That for me would be, might be the piece of, well, I think it's within the sort of Helen's chapter, the head chapter Helen led on the institution innovations. The scaling fund for me would be something I'm not quite sure how that's fitting in there. And I think Lawrence made a very good point that it's not sufficient just to have um, scaling readiness. You need that enabling environment, the ability to bring in and, and link up with those key partners, be it in the private or public sector. So those for me would be kind of parts of the architecture that I'm not quite sure how they're playing in rather than the golden eggs. Um, well, we should go back and check that, Rodney. Thank you for the question. <laughs> Thanks, Graham. Perhaps I would add there uh, some issues of uh, post-harvest and processing that are uh, not clear yet where they fit. That's good, actually. Yes, you're right. Those are not clearly found a home perhaps yet. It's a very good point, Vivi. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Graham. I think those are um, those are the questions we received. So we're going to our final set of slides. Marco had his hand up. Marco, just on oh. that point. Okay, Sorry for cutting in. Yeah, yeah. So just Go very ahead, briefly, uh, very briefly, if I may add a perspective to Rodney's question and to Graham's uh, eloquent, eloquent response. Look, I think that RTB goes a long way in clarifying CGIR's role, right, on the spectrum from research to development, right, where research starts, of course, at the level of, of basic research, which is not really CGIR's uh, space. Our space is 
is applied research, but then our space is not or should not include, although sometimes it does because of funding, because of funding realities, should not include actual implementation of development projects. What it should include, however, is applied research that is inspired by the best of basic research that is out there. And that goes, that takes the next step to innovation. And innovation is always through partnerships. Delivery is through partnerships. And so there we are not necessarily, uh, and we're clearly by definition, not the only uh, uh, player because in a partnership you're one one player among many and we may not necessarily even be at the center of a, a particular partnership but we need to be clear in our own minds as to what is the marginal contribution that we can make and only we can make to to scaling partners uh, that, that 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 is necessary for the scaling to be to be able to happen and so in this sense uh, the thinking about innovation here is extremely important and it is an addition to the way uh, to where we come from traditionally as an institution we want to bring innovation that concept those concepts that, that are in the book and in in, in other books the contributions by hugo uh, for uh, campus for example we want to bring that into the dna of the organization there is a reason why the CGIR research and innovation strategy to 2030 that we approved a little bit more than a year ago is called research and innovation strategy in a first version it was only called the CGIR research strategy and we have done we've done a lot of work including with input from um, scientists and voices at at uh, at, at, at SIP uh, that are now of course finding their finding uh, their contributions synthesized in the book they have contributed to the internal discussion that led to a situation where the title of that research strategy became research and innovation strategy so there is a lot here there's a lot of work going forward and RTB of course uh, it, I expect RTB to be a major voice going forward in one CGIR as we clarify our our, our work and make sure that innovation gets its proper pride of place that it deserves. Over. Thank you very much, uh, Marco, and we're happy to see that footprint on the innovation made. So we're going to claim it as a as a footprint. Thank you, um, Viviana. Can we share the slides? Sure. Give me a second. So we're reaching the end of this um, of this big celebration for us. Uh, as team of authors and, and all of our partners. So we would like to frame a few special thanks. Uh, thanks to 117 authors and many other unnamed contributors who did the research, the writing for this fantastic publication. It was a collective effort of many and we're very grateful for all the time you've devoted into this publication, but not only the time in the writing, but the time in the actual operation and development of the innovation. Um, we also want to share a special thanks to the wonderful publication team at Springer. They have been truly amazing, uh, patient and supporting, uh, supportive uh, of all of this process. They've been with us hand to hand um, along the process. And maybe that's one of the reasons we, we didn't go for, a, for a, a dedicated journal because they offered us flexibility in terms of the size, the images that will allow us to tell a better story. And sometimes when you're talking about innovation, you need to tell the story graphically as well. We want to thank all farmers and value chain actors, both women and make, men who made all of this possible and who we serve and who we hope that all of these innovations will support and contribute to enhance their livelihoods. Next, a special thank you to all of the donors, the CGIAR Trust Fund contributors who have supported RTB along its two phases uh, to produce all of these innovations. And a very special thank you, next please, to some of our key supporters within the, the donor community who have paid special attention to our work. The next one, please. So some of our donors have also engaged um, more closely into supporting us to develop this, uh, this um, innovations. We wanna thank the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office uh, from the UK, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, ACIAR from the Australian government, um, the Swiss Federation and the World Bank who have been there along the way supporting RTB along the process along with all the other trust fund contributors. Next one, please. And last but not least, uh, Marco already mentioned um, 
from the bottom of our hearts, a big thank you to Barbara Wells. Barbara championed our crops and our methods for collaborative and participatory processes to make RTV research possible. It was because of her leadership uh, of this process, uh, along with Graham, that enabled a horizontal articulation of the multiple actors and facilitated this um, horizontal, you know, uh, way of working that made RTV a big family and that leveled power dynamics to make it empowering for all of those that were part of the team. So a big thank you to her, wherever she is um, in, the, in the highlands of the Andes with the wind. A big thank you for making uh, that horizontal process uh, possible. And I do not have a slide for this, uh, but I do also want to express a big thank you to Graham, who was a leader, a mentor and a friend for all of this RTV community uh, throughout the years. Thank you, Graham, for all of your energy. Uh, we call him internally the energy bunny. He never runs away. Uh, he never dies down in terms of energy. He's always full of ideas and is push, was pushing the team to make this possible. Thank you everyone for attending this event.